Good evening, everyone. Let's all go ahead and take our hymn. We're going to turn hymn number 477 at Calvary. Let's all stand and sing hymn number 477. services tonight and we ask that you would uh, be with the, all the classes of young children now in church and teens and God we pray for the fall awards coming up and God that you would uh, uh, that you would have your will and your way with everything that would be done God and that uh, uh, God that the gospel would go for it and God we just pray for uh, all the things that uh, go for it. go ahead and pray for our prayer sheets as we go before we go over it God that you would just uh, touch everybody in their many needs and God all the uh, ones who helped us past week with uh, loss and uh, God with death and their families and uh, with those that uh, just dealing with a lot of other things. God, we just pray that you continue to work through them. We ask God to be your life. Amen. You may be seated. Let's take our hymnals. Let's turn to hymn number 442. 442. Praise Him. Praise Him. That's hymn number 442. Praise Him. Praise Him.
good seeing you here tonight. And uh, God has been uh, blessing our church, but he's also, the devil has been fighting, obviously. And we know that, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I'm thankful that we serve a risen Savior. Amen. And uh, it's wonderful to know that God uh, has all these things in control. If you would take out your prayer sheet, uh, there's some, some things we want to continue uh, praying about. Continue to pray for uh, Kelly and Darla and family and uh, pray also, if you would, for the Amoses. Uh, Andrea, uh, she thought the insurance adjuster was coming today. Uh, it was the fire marshal, and she heard from the insurance adjuster uh, on the home uh, today while the fire marshal was there, and he won't be there until next Thursday. So uh, pray for them. They're kind of in a, uh, just a holding pattern right now, but... Uh, as soon as, as soon as we know something, something else that we can do, uh, I'll pass it on to you and let you know. But uh, may need some labor uh, sometime if they can you get some things cleaned up there. Uh, but anyway, I'll let you know as time goes on. So continue to pray for them. And uh, I think it was pretty much uh, they lost most of their things. Billy was able to save some of his stuff there in the house fire. Uh, but they did lose most of the other things that they had. So... Um, also, if you would, we're going to add, we prayed for him, I think, the last couple of weeks here. We're going to add Freddie Ferguson, uh, still not uh, doing well, and just want to put him here on the prayer list. And then also, if you would pray for Timothy, he's leaving out Friday, and uh, I'm sure he's looking forward to that, uh, his trip to Jordan. So um, he'll be gone about nine weeks, I think, and uh, be back towards the end of July, so pray for him. Uh, let's get some changes, updates, or deletions from their prayer list from you all. Any changes, updates, or deletions? Yes, friend. Um, my brother didn't get to have his surgery on Monday. But the Lord took him really far to do this as much. Because he passed out a few weeks in mercy room. And he wasn't sure about his salvation. But if I got this plea, he accepts the Lord as his Savior. But he had it yesterday, and uh, it's a serious surgery. They didn't get all the cancer. But I still know that the Lord is in his hands, and he might have to have another surgery, but he might have to have to move all the way. But the Lord is working it out. That's but right. I'm for sure he was saved, and not for sure that he was, but he really wasn't. Yeah. So he said he was that straight. Well, that's, that's great. Praise the Lord. That's Eddie Thomas. If you would pray for him. Uh, and praise the Lord there for his decision. And, you know, sometimes sometimes God has to allow us to get to places like that before you know, it finally gets our attention to the point where we start thinking uh, thinking about eternal things. And uh, I'm glad that uh, he was receptive you know, to that. Anybody else? Updates, changes, or deletions? Yes, Ms. Carol Clark. and her follow-up today. And she walked in, he said, how you doing? And she said, it depends on what you got to say. Yeah. And he said, then you're great. Well, good. That's great. Carolyn Davis, so praise the Lord for that. That's a good praise. Yes, Doug. Sure, I'm just trying to get some of this silence. So sorry. She's not feeling good. Okay, so pray for Sharon Mullins. <clears throat> Yes, Trina. Um, can you pray for my mom? She sent us this to um, a doctor about the spirit in her liver, how much she is home, and um, <coughs> so we just we can continue to pray for that she stays in her and it just it's to make her to the prayer list and okay. it, um and it just changes her health. So we're looking for her. Okay. So we're gonna add Cindy Offenberger and um <coughs> She was in a lot of pain, uh, I think it's Saturday, wasn't it? And uh, a lot of pain, they actually were at a funeral service, I think, up in Hinton, and then um, they stopped at the hospital there uh, in Hinton, and it was just, it was you know, scary um, from what they were telling her. And then by the time they finally got her down to Roanoke, uh, the doctor down there from what um, Beth had told me that this is just a rare thing that happened. The cyst apparently 
there was a blood vessel or something that was on the system, it burst, and the bleeding there was part of what was causing the problem. But she got low in blood, and they had to give her some blood, her blood pressure was dropping and other things. But that blood vessel had catarized, I guess, within that period of time. And so they were able to get everything fixed if they needed to. And she had the surgery, I think, Sunday morning, Saturday night. So they had the surgery. It took about a half hour to an hour or so. She is on the mend, but continued to pray. It was a cyst on the liver, and just pray that the Lord would take care of that and she wouldn't have any more issues with it. So just never know. Never know what our bodies are doing. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We know that, but sometimes our bodies do other things that they're not normally supposed to do. But it's just the way part of our life is. Any others? Updates? Yes, sir. Patty Parker, she's been on the desk all the time. She stopped the train, and I stopped to see her. Patty Harper and a lot of fans. Anything you can do for her. Okay. Any others? Yes, here, sir. My cousin's widow, Judy McClendon, was in a car wreck last Tuesday. Like that, I mean, I think it was something to do with the medicine. Maybe. Mm. But uh, her airbag did not perform because she's sore still. She's normally there. Judy McClanahan, Frank Burr, and Carrick. <clears throat> Any others? And there's obviously a lot of needs here in the prayer list that we have. Did I miss some? some? I didn't go up anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got this bar on the top of my glasses and it cuts out that row right there. So I need to do this or something, I guess. Very special unspoken. Okay. How many other unspoken requests do we have tonight? Let's go ahead and pray for them. And uh, let's do this tonight, if we could. Uh, we're going to split the prayer list up here, and we'll pray. First of all, I'll call on someone to pray and pray for the names that the Lord puts on your heart, as far as the the different needs, the health needs, and uh, spiritual needs that are on the list. Uh, and then also, I'll call on somebody else to pray, the second person, uh, and if they can pray, concentrate on the unspoken request, and then our missionaries and other ministries from the back. And you pray silently as they're praying aloud, and we want to try to hit as many of these names as possible as they're praying, uh, because obviously they're not going to remember all of them, but I think it's with all of us praying together, uh, we should be able to hit most of these names as we go down through here and pray tonight. And, uh, but you know, I'm glad we serve a God who knows our unspoken needs as well. And uh, whether it's a big need, little need, God knows, and he's able to take care of it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, I'm going to ask Dave if he would mind, Dave Balaji, if you mind praying first for the names of sick and spiritual needs there. And then I'm going to ask, uh, is that Mike back there? I can't. Is that Wayne? Okay, I, all I can see was the bald head. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask Wayne if he'd mind just praying for the unspoken and the spiritual needs, please. The, the needs on the back. So let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, well, we thank you so much for this day, for this, for this beautiful time. We thank you for allowing us to be here in the day we have. We just praise you, Father. We praise you.
you for one day you've given the commandment of the Lord to you, and for all you've been blessed with. <coughs> Most of all, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and trust him with all and all for our We pray for all these many young pray for requests that you have. You know what we are. We put all these people at ease for salvation and get everything right with you, Lord. We thank you for preaching the law, being in the mind, and for bringing us your word. <coughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Just a few announcements here to let you know about. Uh, of course, we had uh, a baptism here uh, this past Sunday, and we're excited about that. Natalie Miller uh, getting baptized, and then this Sunday we're going to have another baptism. Uh, and this Sunday, uh, Addie Darnell is going to get baptized. She got saved last year at Coal Wars, and uh, so she's ready to get baptized, and of course she'll uh, join the church. Anytime children get baptized, they don't have to join the church the same way adults do. Uh, if their uh, parents are already members of the church, they just naturally become members of the church uh, with their family. And then, of course, as they get up to adults, if they ever change their membership somewhere else, they can do that if they need to. Uh, but also this Sunday, Jerry Hollinsworth is going to get baptized. And uh, I was talking with Jerry and I uh, talked to them a while back, and of course, uh, both of them know they're saved, and they both want to join the church. Uh, we were talking about uh, getting baptized by immersion, and, and he has a little, uh, some, uh, little bit of things there in his past as far as baptism. He was actually christened, and uh, that was a big part of his family, and you know what they did in church, and... He struggled with that for a while. The devil will use anything he can to discourage us. Uh, he just struggled with that for a while because he, I think in a way he kind of felt like he was letting his family down uh, if he did anything different. But uh, he knows this is what the Lord wants him to do. Um, and I told him because he's a little more fragile, so uh, I'm going to actually have uh, Preacher Dan here assist me with him. Um, because he's not able to dip his knees to kind of help really in any way, so we're going to have to be careful with him going back and then bringing him back up. Uh, but anyway, we'll have all that worked out. And I'm just uh, thankful. And you know, a lot of times people, and I know this is how the devil works, and I can tell even by looking on some of your faces, I told him this won't happen. Uh, he mentioned to me as I was talking to him, he goes, well, he goes, some people may be, they may think, you know, and say this or say that. And I said, you know, I said, that's the way the devil works. I said, I have a feeling there's going to be more people rejoicing Amen. with you as you Amen. do this. Because it's an exciting thing. It's, yes. You know, when a brother or sister of Christ rejoice, we rejoice with them. If they weep, we weep with them. And uh, that's the way God wants, that's the way he wants it to be. And that's the way it is. Uh, we feel the things with them. And, and I'm just thrilled to death for him. And I told him, I said, it's a big step. I said, you pray about it, and then you just let me know. And uh, So anyway, he's going to do that Sunday. That's the plan right now. You pray for their health. Their health has been uh, a little shaky uh, for a while. And uh, just pray that everything worked out where he can be here. If not, we'll do it another time. Um, we'll get it worked out there. But anyway, Addie is uh, planning on getting baptized this Sunday, so we're excited for her. And uh, I know that's a big step in her life as well. Um, we also have a few things coming up here uh, in just a couple weeks. Of course, this Saturday is the street ministry is going to Hillsville, Virginia. Uh, so pray for them. And I think they got the van driver situation taken care of. And uh, and then also the following Sunday, uh, June 4th, is our Farmer Sunday, Old Fashioned Sunday. And uh, so we're uh, going to honor our farmers here in the service. If you would... And you uh, take care of a farm, you have a farm, please let me know. Uh, we, would, we have something we'd like to give you. And, uh, you know, I always try to think of this. And anytime you can come up with something, uh, an idea, please let me know. Because the thing I struggle with Farmer Sunday, uh, you can always find those little tractors, but you can only handle so many little tractors. I mean, it's like, what are you going to do with a little tractor? I would like, and then you can get a ball hat, but you can only get so many hats, you know. So I wanted to get something, and this year I think I have something different, something that they'll enjoy, uh, that they can use. And uh, But we want to get something there to at least honor them and recognize them. And I appreciate uh, all the work they do. It's a, it's a lot of work taking care of a farm. And I know sometimes 
uh, you know, with dairy cows and other things. You know, they have things they have to do, and sometimes they have to miss church because of it. But I appreciate their faithfulness when they can be here. Um, but anyway, we're going to have a meal after that morning service. And uh, if there is a sign of seat in the vestibule, so if you wouldn't mind signing that, if you plan to be here uh, for that. And then the Sunday after that, Cold Wars is getting ready to get started. It's hard to believe it's already here. I feel like we just went through Cold Wars. I just, I was just thinking, I'm thankful Wayne prayed for me because I was like, man, I just, I feel like I've got serious brain fog, just like I'm in, you know, tired, and worn out, and, and I think we all have been that way. It's been, been a crazy spring. It's just been a busy, busy spring for us, but uh, it's been a good spring. And but pray for our Cold Wars. Pray for safety. Pray for Brother Nate. Uh, pray for the speakers that will be in here with the kids and also those who do the little ones. Uh, pray that God's will be done and, and some souls be saved and we'll be able to reach some families uh, with the gospel. And then, of course, the dates in, for teen camp and junior camp are in the bulletin. Don't forget you have to register online this year for that. And uh, if you're interested in going, if you have multiple kids, let me say this, if you have multiple kids going to camp, we like to help you out with at least one or two. Like, if we have three kids, we like to help those families out. We have a lot of kids going. Uh, each year I have people who come and say, hey, I'd like to sponsor a child. And that's a big help for these families because that expense will add up in a hurry. And we want as many kids going to camp as possible because that's a great, great week for them. Get a lot of preaching, uh, a lot of Bible. Um, they have a fun time while they're there. And uh, this will be the first time our teens will be at the Greenbrier Christian Retreat. I think they'll have a great time up there. Uh, but anyway, those dates are in the bulletin. Don't forget to register with that online. I think that's all the announcements I have right now. So let's all stand. Let's welcome one another to our service. And then we'll prepare for our Wednesday night offering. <laughs>
All right, let's all take our hymnals. Let's turn to hymn number 292, Surely Goodness and Mercy. Let's all stand as we sing. Hymn number 292 this evening. Shalt thou require him, 
If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we have returned the second time. And the father of Israel said unto them, If it must be so, now do this. Take of the best fruits of the lands in your vessels and carry down the, the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, and nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And in this story, what we're going to look at here tonight is the life of Judah and what is going on in Judah's life. And God has been working in Joseph's life to save much people alive, but he has also been working in the life of Judah to bring him to the place that every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ ought to come to, and that is the place of surrender. So let's pray, and we'll get into the message. Our Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures, and I pray that you will direct my thoughts. I pray that, Lord, you will use the word of God to uh, guide and lead us into all truth, but help us, Lord, to learn these great lessons that you have for us. Help us, Lord, to make sure that we've had this time in our life. It's very important for us to know that we know that we're saved. But, Lord, it's, it's just as important to know that we have given everything over to you and let you have it all, let you have our life and everything in it. And, Father, I just pray and ask that you will uh, do a great work now, and we pray all these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, when we get to the end of this particular chapter, the brothers have returned to Egypt, and they're there now with Benjamin, and we're not going to read all of chapter 43 down to the end, but they're with Benjamin, and Joseph makes a great feast with them, and he gives Benjamin, uh, his youngest brother, gives him several times more portions than he does the other brother. And this, you would think this would be a time, a great opportunity for Joseph to reveal himself to his brothers. But he does not take this opportunity to do so. When we get to chapter 44, and this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time here. When we get to chapter 44, we may wonder why Joseph didn't seize the moment. But the truth of the matter is this, God was not done dealing with his brothers, especially Judah. And God does not violate our will, but what he does is he deals with us in such a way that we can see God's hand in everything. And then when we see his hand at work in our lives, he gives us the opportunity to fully surrender everything to him. Now I'm going to read a part here of Genesis 44, and this is after they've made the feast, they've been... Living it up there in Egypt, the brethren, they have their stuff now. And chapter 44 is where we're going to pick up the story. It says, And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, this is Joseph, of course, talking, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in a sack's mouth. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city, and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have you rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold the money which we found in our sacks' mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack, 
And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Watch ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the couple stand. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as fair. Now, what we need to notice in this part of the story is Judah's attitude. His attitude has changed throughout the book of Genesis here. And when we first come across Judah, and we come across the story of Joseph in chapter 37, he didn't care at all about Joseph. Judah was a very self-centered, self-righteous individual. He didn't care how much he was going to hurt Joseph, and he didn't care how much of what he allowed his father to think. He didn't care how much it was going to hurt his father. But God had something here and, and for these men, especially for Judah. And now Judah has come to a place where he is at his wit's end. He realized that everything that has happened to them was all directed by God. If you look at verse 16, there's a little phrase there right smack in the middle of the verse. It says, God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. What do you think the sin was he was referring to? It was what they did to Joseph. A lot of, they still don't know who Joseph is. But they know that God did not let that sin slide by. And everything that has happened to them, Judah finally comes to a place where now he's just not feeling guilty. Now he realizes God is trying to reckon with him. And Judah comes to a place of complete and total surrender in his life. If we look here in chapter 49, let's turn over there if you would, chapter 49, I want you to see just a couple of verses here. God was doing a work in all of these brothers' lives, but especially something different here in the life of Judah. Genesis chapter 49, if you would, look at verse number 8. Now this is where uh, Israel is now foretelling some things about his son. He's blessing his sons. And he's foretelling some things about his sons. And he gets down to Judah in verse 8. It says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couches a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, this is a very important prophetic passage dealing with the life of Judah. If you remember in Revelation what it says about Jesus Christ, he is described as the lion from the tribe of what? Of Judah, specifically. And here in this particular passage, when it talks about in verse 10, it says, until Shiloh come, the word Shiloh means rest. This is actually one of the names that is used for the Lord Jesus Christ because he is our rest. We found that when we studied the book of Hebrews, how important that rest is. And, of course, Jesus Christ is our rest, and that's what that word Shiloh means. Now, Joseph could have easily revealed himself at the end of chapter 43, but he doesn't do it yet. And I believe because he was led of the Lord, because in chapter 44, God is still working. He's not still just working in the life of Joseph. He's still working in Joseph's life, but he's still working in the lives of these other brothers. And that's what we need to see. So let me give you a couple things here real quick. If you're 
jotting down points, that was all introduction. Let me just give you the points here real quick. Number one, God deals with individuals. God is always dealing with individuals. He deals with groups of people, but he deals with individuals very specifically. Here's a family of 12 boys, 12 sons, and God is dealing with not just with Joseph, but he's dealing with each and every one of them in a special way, but especially Judah. When God works in a family or even works as he does in a church, he begins in the heart of an individual. And sometimes as he's working in the heart of this individual, he's also working in the heart of this individual and this individual. How many times have we seen God working here in our own church when we'll have, uh, we come up and Dave's doing the adult Sunday school class and, and then uh, he'll say something that actually ties right into my message and I even heard this from Miss Laura and some of the Sunday school teachers. She used to think I would actually uh, look at their Sunday school material, and that's what I was using to preach out of, and uh, because it often lined right up with what she would cover in Sunday school. And I'm telling you, that's just the way God works. As He puts something on my heart, He's also put something on someone else's heart who wrote the material, and then put it on the heart of Byron to buy that material at a certain time. So now we cover all of this together at a specific moment, and he puts all the pieces together. Yeah. And that's exactly what is happening here in the life of Judah. As he's dealing with Joseph and dealing with his other brethren, he's got all these things lined up now specifically working in the life of Judah. Years ago, as I was, uh, I went, uh, I was, we was actually going through a soul winning program in our church, and uh, the pastor and I were uh, going through this program and, and learning how to do, it was called Operation Go, and we were learning different steps, you know, as far as uh, things to help us in winning people to Christ. And little things that you need, you know, as you get, you know, go out and talk to people, some things that we learn, and I cover some of this in our personal evangelism class, some things you should never do, some things that we ought to keep in mind when we go out. But anyway, we were going through these things, and, and we were thinking of people that we could go visit that we weren't sure if they were saved or not, that we could go visit. And we were asking people in the church, hey, if you have anybody who wants to go visit, you're not sure they're saved, we'd be happy to go visit them. Well, my sister gave us the name of one of her friends. And so we decided to go visit her. And, and my goal, I was the one who was the, going to be the, the main talker. The pastor was going to be uh, the second man, if you would. And he was going to be kind of the silent partner in this visit. But as we went, the goal was to lead her to Jesus Christ. That was the goal. Well, she had a live-in boyfriend. And as we got there, we knocked on the door. She was very hospitable, invited us in. We were talking and made some small talk a little bit. Anyway, got around to actually giving the gospel. Now, while I was giving the gospel to her, of course, the pastor's sitting next to me, and he's he's praying while this is going on, you know, with his eyes open. You know, he's praying. You don't just sit there and get, fall on your knees. You, know, you don't do that when you're out visiting people. But he was just praying silently there as I was talking and praying the Lord's will be done. Well, her boyfriend didn't want anything to do with this visit. He knew we were from the church, and he was busy in the other room doing other things, whatever it was he was doing. But as I was talking about different things, I happened to catch the fact that he was in the other room, and I could see him looking through the crack in the door. And he stopped what he was doing, and he was just looking and listening. So I kept talking to her. And we went through the whole plan of salvation, went through every single step. And I asked her, I said, would you like to pray and ask the Lord to save you and forgive you your sins? She said, well, yeah, sure, I think I'd like to do that. And just very nonchalant, you know, but well, and she decided she was going to pray. Well, we led her in the sinner's prayer. To this day, I don't think she really meant that prayer. A prayer doesn't save you. It's the faith God sees in your heart. I don't think she is saved today. She didn't get saved, I don't think, at that particular moment. Because I just didn't believe she was sincere. It was just very nonchalant. She was just trying to be extra polite. But what I did not know, at what that young man, I noticed when we were praying, everything got really silent in the other room. He was in there banging stuff in the bathroom and whatever else he was doing. But it got really silent. And I believe with all my heart, he prayed and trusted Christ as his Savior while I was praying with her because a week later, he ended up breaking up with her because he said, hey, what we're doing is not right. We can't be living together like this. This is sinful. And she didn't want anything to do with it. She goes, well, we can do this. Everybody else is doing it. 
And because she wouldn't, she wouldn't do what his wishes were, he just decided to break up with her. I think he got saved. You see, God was working, even though we thought the goal was here, dealing with her, God had a plan and purpose dealing with him. God works like that all the time. There was a, a pastor who had gone up to talk to a lady at the door. He was out knocking on doors, and she answered the door. And as he was talking to her there at the door, he asked her the same thing. He said, hey, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? They, he went through the whole plan of salvation with her, and she said, yeah, I think I would like to do that. And he had her bow her head right there at the door, and she prayed and trusted Christ as her Savior. But little did he know there were other ears listening, and here comes a little girl around the side of the door, about 11, 12 years old, and said, Mommy, do you think I can do that too? You see, as we think God's working in just one individual's life, God is so wise in what he does. He's oftentimes busy working in multiple people's lives whose lives are intertwined together, and God is at work in all these individuals' lives. But God works in the lives of individuals. But here's something else that's important, and we know this to be true. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 teaches us that God's ways are not our ways. The way God works in the lives of individuals, his ways are not our ways. If we look at the story of Joseph again, and it begins back in chapter 37, and, and it seems to go almost to the end of the book. But in chapter 38, there's something interesting that happens there that seems to be unrelated to the rest of what's going on. But it is completely related. Matter of fact, if you turn back there, we're not going to spend a lot of time in chapter 38. But if you look at chapter 38, chapter 38 is about Judah. Judah. And it talks about Judah's sons and how one son did evil and, and how God took him. And, and then it just continued on. And, and the first son was married to a woman by the name of Tamar. Now Ur was the first son and he was wicked and God killed him. We see that in verse 7. In verse 9 there was another son, Onan. And what the tradition was, if you died without children, the next brother would take that wife to be his wife and raise up seed to his brother in his name. And so Onan, he was very selfish. We're not going to go into detail what he did, but uh, what he did was very wicked before God as well, and God killed him. These are two of, jo of Judah's three sons. And then there's the youngest, his name's Shelah, and Shelah was so young, he was not old enough to be given to Tamar. So Judah said, well, wait until he's full grown. Well, the time came where he was full grown, and he still was not given to Tamar. So Tamar takes matters into her own hands. She did something very wicked and played the harlot and actually slept with her father-in-law to raise seed up to his brother. All of these things are happening in the life of Judah. This is tied into the story of Joseph. Joseph's story starts in 37, and then we see chapter 38. All of these events seem to be completely unrelated. But they're related because it brings us to where we're at now in chapter 44. And we see what happens in not just chapter 44, but also chapter 43. If you look back in chapter 43, the section that we read to start with, notice what Judah's response is to his father. In verse 8, he says, And Judah said unto Israel's father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die. But we and thou and also our little ones, I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. I mean, here, he's just very cocky and arrogant. Hey, I've got this, Dad. Don't worry about it. Remember how he started out in chapter 37? He hates Joseph. He's not concerned about his father. He's not concerned about how uh, his father's going to feel. He's not concerned about how Joseph's going to feel. He didn't listen when Joseph was crying for the pit. He didn't listen to that. He's a hard, wicked individual. And the apple didn't fall far from the tree, as we've learned from his two older sons. They were wicked before the Lord, and God killed them. And then some horrible thing happens there uh, with Tamar, and she ends up having seed by Judah. But God is using all of these things at work to bring Judah to a place 
of complete surrender. Everything at work in his life. In chapter 43, he's now the cocky, arrogant son. Until God finally breaks the last straw. Matter of fact, the first time they went down to Egypt, we don't have time to look at the verses, but the first time they went to Egypt, they felt guilty because of what happened to their brother. Remember what they said? They said, hey, this thing is of God. God's doing something here. This is why all this is coming about. But they didn't yet fess up to their sin. And Judah was kind of the one who was mainly in charge here. But as things continue on, he gets into chapter 44. Now he's no longer wicked. Now he's no longer uh, hateful, spiteful, selfish. Now he's not even arrogant. He's not cocky anymore. We get into chapter 44, and whenever Joseph sets it up to where Benjamin has the cup in his sack, and he ends up being the one taken, Judah is the one who is completely broken. If you see in verse number 8, there's a little phrase that you'll see from chapter 18, I'm sorry, chapter 18, verse 18, all the way through the end of the chapter. And we don't have time to read it, we're going to read just a couple verses. But you'll see, thy servant. Thy servant. He is a broken man. You know what God wants from us more than anything else? He wants us to completely surrender to him. He's working out the details in our lives to bring us to that place. But God's ways are not our ways. He deals in the lives of individuals. And he's de desiring to bring us to that great place of surrender. If you look at chapter, uh, chapter 44, look at verse 31. It says, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die, and thy servants, here he is saying that he is now the servant of Joseph, thy servant shall bring down the great hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. What happened to his harvest? What happened to his selfishness that he had before? It's gone. You see, God finally has Judah where he wants him. And because of this, and you go in verse 32, he says, For thy servant became surety for the lad. Then in verse 33, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad. He's ready to give his whole life to protect his family. Everything he has, he's ready to give it all. And all of that goes into chapter 49, those verses, those great prophetic verses about there's the scepter will not depart from Judah. Uh, until Shiloh comes, until the peace is finally there. And that's why he's referred to, uh, Jesus Christ is referred to in Revelation as the line from the tribe of Judah. What all this is teaching us is this, is when God gets all of us, and that's what he wants. We're told in the New Testament we're bought with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God wants all of us to completely and totally surrender everything to him. Sometimes in order to get us to that place, he has to bring us to a place of total brokenness. Bring us to a place where we may feel like we're just simply at our wit's end. But God wants us to realize we belong to him. Years ago, I had a guy in my youth group that uh, he surrendered to preach. He went off to Bible college, and uh, while he was at Bible college... Uh, his first year in Bible college, he had an accident at the plane he worked at. And it, this guy was left-handed, and he loved basketball. But it deformed a couple of his fingers. And it deformed a, it was on a shooting hand. And I told him, I said, you know what? I said, that's actually not a bad thing. He goes, what do you mean, preacher Wall? I said, what that is, if you look at it correctly, that is simply a mark of ownership that you are not yours anymore. You belong to him. I said, if you look at it correctly, every time you thought you would be some great basketball player in college and all this, God says, no, that's not what I want for you. I want you to be a man of God. And every time you see that hand, that's going to be a reminder of what God wants to do in your life. And that young man today, he's pastoring a large church down in Texas, doing a great job, a great work. God's used him in a great way, has a wonderful family. And I'm just here to tell you, I don't know if that's exactly what God was doing, but sometimes God has to remind us who we belong to. We belong to him. 
We don't belong to ourselves. And the thing that, as we think about all these things, is God is working in individuals' lives, and God's ways are not our ways, and He's all the time trying to bring us to a place of surrender. Sometimes we get overly concerned about what happens to us. What is happening to us? And we all, if we're honest with ourselves, we sometimes blame God. God, what are you doing to me? But it's not so much what He is doing to us, but it could be what he is doing in the lives of those around us. You see, God's working in our life, but he's also working in the lives of others. And that's what we have to realize. That's what we have to rest in. It's like when we were in Tennessee, God was doing a work in my heart in Tennessee. That was a hard time for us. And I went through the valley in Tennessee, and God had to bring me to this place here where I was at the end of myself, had nowhere to turn but to him. And just, Lord, whatever you want to do, here it is. It's all yours. But while he was working in my life, he was also working in the lives of our children, of my wife. There's other things that are involved. And our lives affect other people. Judah's attitude at the end of all this is something that it's not one of stubbornness. It's not one of selfishness. But what it is, it's a wonderful story of how God can make a life over again. How he can give a fresh start no matter how old we are. No matter how far we might have gotten away from him, God is always able to give a fresh start. And Judah's attitude through all this, basically as the story ends in chapter 44, is I would rather live the rest of my life in bondage compared to what happened to Joseph. I'd rather live the rest of my life in bondage than to see my father's heart broken. He didn't care before, but now he cares because God has all of him. So we see through all of this in this whole story as we're looking at the life of Joseph, we see all the things happening in Joseph chapter 37 through the end end of the book, chapter 50. There's actually a little pause in chapter 38 that mentions Judah. And then we see all these other things happening in the life of Judah, and that is all tied. It's the story within the story of what God is doing. Joseph, God was doing his life to save much people alive, save his whole family alive, save not just his family, but the Egyptians and other nations. God used Joseph in a great way, but God was using Judah as well. He could not use him yet, but now he can. And Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. That was how important all this is. That's how it all ties together. So don't ever underestimate what God is doing. Realize his ways are not our ways and what he's doing. He has a tremendous plan and purpose if we simply rest in him. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. And Lord, these stories that we come across in the Bible with the the life of Joseph and even here with the life of Judah and what you're doing in his life, there's so much more there. I hope, Lord, I was clear as I was trying to present it. But Lord, I pray that you just make these truths that we have in the Word of God, drive them home in our hearts that as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we do not belong to ourselves. We belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we need to give you everything. As you say there of the early church, the Christians in Antioch and other places, you tell us that they first gave their own selves unto you. And that's simply what you want, Lord. You just want us. You want us before you want our possessions, our money, other things. You want us. So, Lord, help us to give ourselves totally and completely, not holding anything back. And just allow you to have your way and will in our life because, Lord, you will use our life to reach lives around us if we let you. Father, we pray and ask your blessing now in this invitation time. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 351, as we sing here a few verses of the song of invitation. God spoke to your heart, won't you come? Or maybe you just need to come pray. Step out where you are and do business with the Lord.
bless you. Hope you have a great rest of your week. And we're going to dismiss here in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Rodney if he might close the prayer for us, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Lord, for the day that you have given, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the message that we just received, Lord. Pray that you uh, let us be able to use it and apply it to our lives today, Lord. Pray for each and every prayer request on our prayer sheet tonight, Lord. Pray that you just bless it and have your will and way with it, Lord. Pray for traveling mercies we travel back to our respective homes, Lord, and bring back the next point in time, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for just the gift of salvation that you have given through your bloodshed, Lord. Pray that you just uh, be with us once again, Lord, and uh, give us guidance as we go throughout the week, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night.